Uh, you might have seen one out there in the, um, the real world. This instrument here was added. It's no longer available in this form, but this is the Handled Nucleic Acid Analyzer, or HANA. It was developed out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and it detects thought threat agents such as anthrax. Moving clockwise, we have portable devices. These devices are a little bit larger than handheld devices, but approach the size of a laptop. They may be battery operated for uh, transient power losses, but usually they are powered through an electrical outlet. So this device is analogous to the iStat. It does similar tests, such as electrolytes and metabolites again. This device specifically is used for cardiac biomarker testing. So I mentioned this phrase before, cardiac biomarker testing is, our, or actually our assays, which target enzymes that are released after someone gets a heart attack. So the cells that die will release these enzymes, and these are used to quantitate those values and determine if that patient truly has a heart attack or not. This instrument here also does electrolyte testing, so you can see they, are, they may be card-based or just take a sample in directly from a vial of blood. Moving on, we have transportable devices. This device right here is too large to be carried, so it has to be moved around a wheeled cart. It ha it's solely used for um, point of care, but it requires an electrical outlet for power, so that limits its mobility. This instrument here is from a company called Nova Biomedical. It does a variety of tests, including blood gases, so pH, partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of CO2 in the blood. Bench top devices are a subset of transportable devices. They're just shown here to give you um, an overview of its diversity in that category. And over here, we have monitoring devices, which are a very interesting group of devices. They can be connected to an indwelling catheter in a patient to provide near continuous monitoring. So they'll take a sample every 30 minutes and give you results, such as, again, blood gases. So it's rather important, but especially in neonates and pediatric patients. This device right here is a wireless insulin infusion pump. It connects wirelessly to a continuous glucose meter, so it will read the patient's glucose level and then adjust the insulin infusion rate appropriately so you don't have to give yourself a shot every, after every meal, for example, if you're a type 1 diabetic. Disposable devices may be something you're more familiar with. They're single use, of course, and Right here is an example of a card-based immunoassay for cardiac biomarker tests. So it's based on enzyme-linked uh, immunosorbent assay technology, or ELISA. This device here is actually a disposable bowel sensor, which looks for a protein that gets glycosylated in the presence of glucose. The higher the glucose that you have over a time interval, weeks or months, the more glycosylated this protein is. The protein is called hemoglobin A1C. This device has a LCD monitor here to give you a quantitative result. You use it once and you just throw it away. And lastly, we have a oral swab-based HIV test. So really easy to use, great use for screening. So you can see that point care testing encompasses a great deal of analytes as well as testing modalities. You might guess that these may be only used in a hospital, but of course, in the next slide, which shows special applications of point of care testing, you can see that it's used actually in disaster response. This is based on our survey during Hurricane Katrina. And you can see that the military, the U.S. Army 14th Combat Support Hospital, really likes point of care testing. Use it for ABO blood typing, again, for cardiac biomarker testing, coagulation testing. And the ISAT device shows up again, as well as this instrument called the Piccolo. It's analogous to the ISAT. And a great variety of glucose monitoring tests, as well as tests for drugs of abuse. Feel free to stop me at any time you have any questions, too, by the way. So, therefore, we can now define point-of-care testing as diagnostic testing at or near the site of patient care. It does not depend on the type of instrument, as you've seen already. The goals are to improve medical and economic outcomes and to decrease therapeutic turnaround time. So, you might ask me, what is therapeutic turnaround time? Well, it's the time from test order to patient treatment. To visualize this concept, we have this figure. Up here we have a bar that represents therapeutic turnaround time for a normal device used in a hospital laboratory. The x-axis right here is time in minutes. The red zone shows the time from test ordering to result received, then results received to treatment, so the yellow zone. 
And green shows the, t the time of treatment to patient outcome, patient outcome being if the patient actually responds to that treatment or not, whether it be a good response or a bad response, it doesn't necessarily matter. Well, when we use whole blood analysis, WBA, at the point of care, this time interval shown up here is compressed down to 10 minutes. So it goes from 35 minutes to 10 minutes. So you can see the decrease in therapeutic turnaround time based on the use of point of care testing. Okay. Yes? Yeah, so I mean, in general, is there some threshold or, or rule of thumb as to what, what kind of turnaround time would be considered acceptable? For acceptable? Um, depends on... Some, some tests from a hospital setting, for example, we use a test, as you already know, the, this pathogen detection test where it takes five hours to give yourself results. The difference between five hours versus one hour with newer tests isn't that significant, at least in terms of critical, critical care setting. But for other groups, for example, where there's a high turnover rate, such as following a disaster, that may be more relevant. Maybe, may, there might be a necessity for faster turnaround time so you can turn over patients real fast and send them to higher echelons of care. So it really depends on what you're looking for and also the clinical setting. Here's what I was asking you guys, you know, is reducing turnaround time from 30 minutes to 10 minutes good enough, or you're still working on 20 minutes more? The, the, the faster the better, but not without compromising accuracy. That's essentially where it's at right now, because there, uh, you can see that some tests, for example, using that analogy, uh, rapid strep tests that some of us may come into the unit will take a few minutes, but the sensitivity and specificity of that test may not be as uh, ideal compared to more traditional methods, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So the faster, the better, but without compromising accuracy and performance. So what does point of care testing do here? So we can see in this figure, it bridges the gap between empirical judgment and evidence-based medicine. So this is a new term that has come to us probably in the early 21st century, maybe a little bit um, in the late 90s, but essentially evidence-based medicine is defined as the conscientious and judicious use of the latest information, medical information and technology to provide the best possible care. So having said that, we now go into the principles and clinical applications of optical point of care biodetection. We'll first start off with pathogen detection, at least in this context. I did my dissertation in this area, and ages ago, if you were to come in and have a suspected infection, they would use something what's called culture. So maybe you've probably seen culture plates out there before in your labs, whether it be a tissue culture or some other culture. Well, of course, this technology has been around for ages, since the 1870s. Robert Koch out um, in Europe did his Koch's postulates, where he had to identify an organism, isolate it grow it, and re-inoculate it into an organism to prove that organism is truly the causative agent in that disease. The problem is you're totally dependent on growth. Therefore, it could take several hours, and actually in hospital settings, it could take up to 24 hours to know what kind of organism that is. Well, patients who have an infection may have a more severe form, which is Systemic called sepsis it affects about 750,000 Americans each year with a mortality rate between 28 and 50 percent. Studies show since 1999 that if you treat inadequately in the first 24 or 40 hours, that is, you do not use the right antibiotics for that organism, your patient is likely going to die. So if it takes 24 hours for you to identify an organism, how does that help the physician? So turns out we can now focus on a different analyte. In this case, some of you may have seen this over at the Life Sciences Edition. This is nucleic acid, specifically DNA. This is not growth dependent. All living organisms, including prokaryotes, have this molecule. The problem is it exists in very small amounts, and so you need to amplify it somehow. So around 1983, a gentleman named Kerry Mullis, actually from the Bay Area, developed something called polymerase chain reaction. This is used to amplify the amount of DNA that you are starting off with, and this is actually specific for the sequence of DNA that you want. You can then use, you can like a sample containing a pathogen, use polymerase chain reaction, shown here as PCR, to amplify your DNA, and then use fluorescence to identify specific sequences of DNA and identify the organism. Of course, this can also be used for genetic disorders, such as cancer, so it's not just limited to pathogen detection. 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with PCR, so I'll just do a very quick overview where you have a double-stranded piece of DNA which is separated through heating, and then specific primers, this is analogous to general DNA replication, polymerases are then added to then elongate that sequence and make copies. This is repeated over and over and over again until you have thousands, millions, and billions of copies of DNA. So as I mentioned previously, you can detect these Aplicons, the DNA products that you, got, you get from polymerase chain reaction, by using fluorescence. And there are four main methods at nucleic acid recognition. Turbidity, which is very simple. It's one of the first few ways of detection. It's cheap, but not specific. Intercalating dyes, also very easy to use, also nonspecific. Hybridization probes gets more specific. And a little bit harder to do, a little bit more expensive, but this is essentially coupled to this next one are the mainstream methods at nucleic acid recognition today, specifically for pathogen detection. The next method essentially uses probe pairs in a, and uses fluorescent resonance energy transfer or FRET to provide higher levels of specificity for pathogen detection. So now I'll go through each of these four methods in detail. <coughs> So turbidity, very easy. Starts out with the reaction vial with a single piece of DNA or your starting amount. Light can pass through rel relatively uninhibited because it's just a solution with very few numbers of DNA. You then go through several cycles of polymerase chain reaction to amplify that amount of DNA. And you have much, much more DNA here, so light as it passes through can become more inhibited. There will be diffraction, as, and you can also look at um, certain wavelengths specific for DNA, such as the ultraviolet range. So you could essentially put this vial into a spectrophotometer and quantitate how much DNA you have, or even just hold it up to the light and see that it's become more cloudy. Of course, like I said, it's not necessarily specific for a certain piece of DNA. Next are intercalating dyes. These dyes have an affinity for double-stranded DNA. They like to fit between the base pairs of DNA. These dyes include aphidium bromide, which is a potential carcinogen, and is now being replaced by a new dye called cyber green. So you can see them fitting into these spaces. Of course, again, not specific. You can have human DNA, but you're looking for pathogen DNA. These dyes will intercalate both types of DNA, and you may not tell the difference. Yeah. Yes? Um, it's not proven yet, but you never know, of course, with any drug, the air we breathe may also be a carcinogen too, but overall it's much safer than aphidium bromide. So I'm not sure, if, have you used aphidium bromide before in your labs and stuff? Yeah, well, little, so they, you know, they give you that caution and warning, yeah. So. And of course, uh, you may be familiar with it on your gels as well, it was used originally on electrophoresis and so forth. So our next slide is fluorescent hybridization probes. First, you need to engineer a sequence of DNA, so you have to know what you're looking for first, So, which underlies inherent potential weakness of nucleic acid-based detection. So you, know, you have to know if you're looking for E. coli, you have to know its sequence, at least to a certain extent. You engineer the sequence and couple that to a fluorophore. You would then apply this probe to the DNA that you just amplified with PCR shown here. You have to melt it first so it's in single-stranded form to facilitate binding this DNA probe shown here, hybridization. And then you can excite the fluorophore and identify its presence, the presence of a specific sequence of DNA. Of course, you would wash out any excess if you're doing this on a gel, for example. Now we build off the hybridization probe concept. We now have probe pairs. We have two probes here that are engineered. We have an anchor probe and sensor probe. Both have a fluorescent um, component attached, a fluorophore. The anchor probe, and please stop me if you're confused with this slide. This is a, sometimes a little bit challenging for some, uh, some of my students. But first, the anchor probe has high sequence homology to your start target sequence. So the base pairs that you've engineered match near perfectly with the target sequence. The sensor probe, on the other hand, has low sequence homology relative to the anchor probe. So there might be a missing base pair or a mismatch with your sequence. What does that do? Well, you'll find out as we increase the temperature, because the melting point for these two sequences will be different. The one with a greater match will stay on at a higher temperature relative to 
the probe that has the less sequence homology. When these probes bind together, they were designed to, when exposed to the right sequence, to be very close to each other so that when excited by blue light, the fluorophore on the anchor probe will be excited. Because it's in close proximity with the sensor probe, the blue light will then excite this fluorophore and it'll emit a red light, which is detected by the device. <clears throat> Again, as you see here, when this happens, you can monitor the binding in real time. This is one of the concepts behind real-time polymerase chain reaction. You can see binding as, and then when you increase the temperature, the sensor probe comes off as a specific melting point, and the, and the, um, the absorbance, the fluorescence, will go down at that time point. This allows you to differentiate between two sequences of DNA that are very close to each other. So two species, two, uh, two pieces of DNA of the same species, but different because they are, they are different subspecies. So if you have a Staphylococcus aureus versus just Staphylococcus species in general, those two sequences may differ, which I'll show in more detail in the next slide. So here you can see that we now fit for less fluorescent resonance energy transfer as well as other fluorescent method, me methods into this last part in detection. So this list of organisms consists of about 25 organisms that cause that systemic inflammatory response called sepsis. So how do we detect all these? And how do we detect all these at the same time? This is what Roche Diagnostics did in a device called the Septifast. This is the instrument down here. This is the setup to operate this device. This next slide shows the melting point. So using FRET once again, I will use this group right here as an example. Right here are wavelengths of light for different types of fluorophores, and the x-axis down here is temperature in Celsius. So at 640 nanometers, you can see we have two organisms here that have been bound by our um, hybridization probes. So these two organisms, K. pneumoniae and K. oxytoca, so they're part of the species Clipsella. They're subdivided into Clipsella pneumoniae and Clipsella oxytoca. Since they're part of the same species, their sequences of DNA will be rather similar. However, we, it is important to know the difference between these two because they may be associated with various other virulence factors. So using fluorescence resonance energy transfer coupled to the melting point of these sequences, you can see that we are able to resolve the difference between these two organisms. So the sensor probe melts off at 58 degrees Celsius here for this organism and 68 to 61 degrees here for this organism. When you go to a completely different species of bacteria, such as right here, Enterobacter erogenes, you can see that it melts off at an even higher temperature. So is that clear for everyone? You guys all understand how DNA melting? It's not standard material melting. Yeah. All right, so these are commercial pathogen nucleic acid detection devices. And we can see here that this device actually is an FDA-approved device currently used for screening of methicillin resistant staph aureus. Again, I don't, I don't want you guys to know the organism names. That's not the point of this um, presentation. But this instrument's here just to illustrate that they're out there. They're moving forward. They're, this instrument here, for example, is cassette-based. It's rather interesting. It reduces the potential for contamination from you or the environment. However, this isn't point of care testing. This may be near a patient, but with a laptop or PC next to it, you can't be moving this instrument around to the patient's bedside. However, there is a trend where uh, we're starting to see instruments moving towards the bedside. That instrument that I showed you earlier in the handheld section of that figure, here's the current day version. It's called the BioSeq. It's used, again, for bio-threat detection. It looks for anthrax, Yersinia pestis, which is the bacteria that causes plague, as well as Francisella tularensis, which um, is uh, the cause of agents of tularemia. This instrument is now being transformed into what they call the BioSeq Clinical. It's for use in the hospital, and it targets methicillin resistant staph aureus, as well as a gastrointestinal tract infection uh, causing pathogen Clostridium difficile. So you can see a trend towards self contained test chambers here, or test reactors, rather than the traditional method of someone sitting behind a, um, a biosafety hood in a lab for about two hours. Of course, the turnaround time for these instruments have become faster. Right here, it'll take one hour for, uh, from sampling to results. 
And these show similar turnaround times. So what can go wrong? These are called confounding factors. And there are many for nucleic acid recognition as shown here. And this is only a brief overview of the main players in inhibiting and interfering substances in nucleic acid recognition. One of the big factors is white blood cell genomic DNA. So if you were to take a sample from a human um, patient who has an infection, of course their white blood cell count will be very high because they're responding to that infection. The problem is the, the genomic DNA inside these cells will be assayed along with the pathogen DNA that you're looking for. So you're essentially looking for a needle in a haystack. But what if you're, I mean, I'm just collecting that you Yes. A little bit of this works. So what if you do you take a primer specific for some type of variable region of a bacterial 16S gene? Mm -hmm. So uh, for. for that, specificity is not the issue there, but sensitivity is. So if you're assay, you're essentially being masked for that primer. Essentially, that sequence that you're looking for is surrounded by thousands upon thousands of, gene, of human DNA. You know how you've heard on the news how large human genome DNA is. And so that can mask it. And that's an important issue. That's a question that many assay developers are trying to answer right now. And the, the magic number so far is if you operate between 300 to 30,000 cells per microliter for white blood cell counts, you're okay. The results show that you can reproduce your control still work and so forth. But beyond those, it can go either way. My study showed that there wasn't an effect but other studies may have implied that there is such an effect. So if you take a, a blood sample or if you took a, uh, if you took a blood sample and you wanted to detect for some for Escherichia coli or yeah. something like that, you want to get a white blood cell count or to see if that could have been? Um, for, not necessarily. If you were to do a validation study, yes, definitely. If you were going to make an assay, you should test for these confounding factors with inoculating your sample with controlled amounts of white blood cells. That's definitely true. If you're using fecal samples? Fecal samples, then you will probably worry about other um, or well, contaminating organisms for one, so similar organisms. So if I think about roughly a third of fecal matter by mass is bacterial mass. So, of course, DNA goes along with that. And also um, the bile and other um, bile salts that may be in there can also cause issues with your assay. So those are the things you have to be um, concerned about. But usually, most assays out there today, after all the washing steps and purification steps, it should lower it down, but that's something to be definitely aware of. So of course, uh, from again, from the blood sample perspective, you also have the presence of DNA degrading enzymes, or DNA, so you're essentially eating up the DNA that you're looking for. Something, again, to consider about urea. So in critically ill patients, Urea could be elevated, especially if they they have uh, acute renal failure. These uh, urea actually damages the, the DNA polymerase in your sample. So I'm not sure if many of you come from a biochemical background, but urea is sometimes used to denature proteins. pH, of course, if you remember in your biochemistry, enzymes work at an optimal pH. So patients who have poor ventilation may have altered pH in their blood due to their um, metabolic pathways and their buffering system. Additive agents, so EDTA, a very common anticoagulant used in laboratory testing and also in sometimes contained in some of your laboratory samples for testing, can also affect the DNA polymerase by chelating magnesium ions, so it's a divalent cation chelator, usually for calcium, divalent calcium, which is a main component in the coagulation cascade. So you have user error. So in our laboratory setting, you or I may be excellent at pipetting, but in the clinical environment, the nurse may not be able to draw a sample, a me medical technologist or a, a paramedic may not be able to draw an adequate blood sample or draw too much sample. That's entirely possible as well. So that can also alter your results. Blood transfusion and fluid resuscitation in the hospital setting, you can give too much fluids just because the patient may be bleeding out. They may have low blood pressure. So you're essentially diluting the sample and reducing your sensitivity for your assay. 
Any questions? So let's change gears and talk about photometric blood glucose monitoring. Of course, here's a slide that shows how many tablespoons of sugar are in a Pepsi can. So there's far too much sugar in our diets today, and, that, and uh, as well as cholesterol, and that's why we have a global epidemic of diabetes, both, um, especially type 2, but also type 1. At least 171 million people in the world suffer from diabetes. This number is expected to double by 2030. An estimated 5.7 million people are believed to be remaining undiagnosed, with 57 million people estimated to have pre-diabetes. So that's a relatively high glucose level, but not to the point where the cutoff is for diabetes. Well, glucose monitoring in this case it allows for daily, hourly, and emergency determination of the instantaneous blood glucose level from usually a capillary blood source. So it's just a finger stick. I'm not sure any of you have friends that are diabetic, so you might have seen this. But it can come from other sources, such as um, blood draws, indwelling lines in the hospital. Well, how this plays out in the critical care setting is what they call tight glycemic control. A long time ago, patients come to the critical care unit, they may be hyperglycemic, that is, have a high blood glucose level, for a variety of reasons. Usually it's stress-induced. So you or I out there, when we're confronted with some kind of stressor, our body will initiate the flight or fight response and break down glycogen to release sugar into the blood. So you have an elevated blood glucose amount. Well, in the critical care setting, especially in surgical patients, of course they're stressed out. You and I would be stressed out in the ICU. They just had surgery. So their glucose levels often are very high. In 2001, Dr. Greet Vandenberg out, at, um, out in Belgium established a study, a groundbreaking study, where she maintained surgical patient blood glucose levels between 80 and 110 milligrams per deciliter. This is the close to the normal glycemic range, the normal range. Compared to controls, she found these patients did much better significantly, so a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Why is that? Well, it turns out that high blood, blood glucose inhibits your white blood cell count. You cannot fight off infections. Those patients that weren't on tight glycemic control did worse, had more infections, and also had impaired wound healing. Wound healing is actually a component of the um, inflammatory response process. So if you were a burnt patient where you actually don't have skin anymore, you have a slower rate of wound healing, therefore increases your chances of having infections such as sepsis in the last section. The problem with tight glycemic control is, is one, it's costly, it's more difficult to do. It's a, it's a higher burden on busy nurses because it requires hourly, at minimum, hourly monitoring of glucose. So every hour a nurse will take a blood sample, identify how much glucose is in the blood at that time point, and adjust insulin therapy accordingly. If glucose meters aren't accurate or the patient has a high resistance or high sensitivity to insulin due to a variety of pathological states, they may go into hypoglycemia, a low blood glucose level. So the risk of hypoglycemic episodes may be increased with, with tight glycemic control. In 2008, or actually around September, Dr. James Crinsley out of Stanford Hospital also did a study and found that glycemic variability, so the ups and downs between each hour of tight glycemic control, it's, not, it's never a flat line, may be associated with poor outcomes as well. And there is potentially a technological component to this, too, based on our glucose biosensors today. So something to think about when we're out there. It's not, we're dealing with both a physiological as well as technological um, challenge in this area and as well as other areas of um, clinical diagnostics. This slide shows tight glycemic control ranges. You can see there's a great variety of ranges that are in use by hospitals today, including our hospital up in Sacramento. It's currently at 80 and 120 milligrams per deciliter. Stanford Hospital out of Connecticut, Dr. Crinsley's group, A125, Duke University, uh, Oregon Health Sciences University, where actually the first protocol was started by Dr. Fernary, a surgeon out there. It's called the Portland Protocol. It's, it was established at 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Numerous studies, including Dr. Vandenberg's, as well as Dr. Pham's, who's uh, over at Shriners Children's Hospital up at UC, uh, UC Davis Medical Center. This was in pediatric burn patients. 
So how do we detect glucose in the blood? Traditionally, it's coupled, it's an enzyme catalyzed redox reaction between glucose and a chromogen, so it's some kind of color changing dye. The color changes based on the electrons generated during the redox reaction. So here's a general overview of the reaction. Glucose plus an enzyme plus the chromogen, after several steps, will induce a color change detected by the instrument. Common enzymes used by glucose monitors include glucose dehydrogenase and glucose oxidase. Glucose oxidase traditionally requires a oxygen um, reactant to go along with it. Chromogens, so the dyes, include these very long uh, chemical names, abbreviated MTT and MBTH. Of course, this is uh, not important for you to memorize, just to know that they are there. Here is a schematic of how testing occurs, traditionally. So you have a disposable lancet. It pricks the finger of the patient to allow some blood drop to um, come out. And then you apply the blood to the test cubet or test strip, and then put it in an instrument. The color change, the reflectance that is measured by this instrument is then measured. In this case, this is the complete reaction for this instrument, by the way. Again, you don't have to memorize this. The ultimate outcome is a blue-green color change. So the, the amount of glucose in the sample is proportionate to the amount of um, color change in the dye. Samples can include capillary, venous, and arterial blood as well. Here is an overview of the current photometric devices that are available commercially. I brought um, them in today, so I'll, I'll leave some time at the end of lecture for you to get some hands-on experience with them. But th these two instruments are from the same companies, from LifeScan, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. And again, a similar concept. You have a sample taken from a finger. It's dosed here on the opposite side of the strip. It has a color change window. As it goes blue, this instrument detects it, the amount of reflectance again is measured, and you have the result, which in this case has 107 milligrams per deciliter. That's, that's pretty good for a patient. And of course, the, instrument, the previous instrument that you saw. So what can cause erroneous or discrepant results with glucose testing? This slide shows a glucose biosensor. This is applies to both photometric as well as aparametric glucose testing. Great deal of factors, all the confounding factors are shown on the left side, so I'll move over here. Oxidizing and reducing substances, so drugs such as acetaminophen can cause aberrant results in your assay, so it, it pulls in electrons or donates electrons. Sample pH, temperature, and so forth can alter your enzyme kinetics, so glucose dehydrogenase and glucose oxidase, the key enzymes used in a glucose reaction in this case, will be um, challenged in uh, turning over your product. Mechanical impedance, so this is a very uh, interesting area. This mechanical impedance is usually caused by red blood cells. Of course, those, that's the most numerous cell, essentially, in your blood. So when you're exposed to a patient that has a high red blood cell count, which is um, tested for it, for in terms of what's called hematocrit, you have a ha if you have a high hematocrit count, the amount of plasma that's in the blood is reduced, relatively speaking. So since glucose is highly solubilized in plasma, the actual glucose that's measured by the instrument from plasma is reduced. So you're detecting essentially a low result, which is not true, so a falsely low result. Conversely, if you have a low hematocrit count, in the case of patients who are bleeding out and losing blood, they may have a high plasma to red blood cell ratio, and thus the glucose that's, that's detected in the plasma will be higher, falsely higher. Additionally, when, with, in terms of mechanical in, impedance, Red blood cell can also actually fall on top of biosensor and block your signal as well. So there's many things in this case that you should be concerned about when you're testing for uh, glucose. Of course, the blood matrix contains a variety of other elements, including the water. Like I said, glucose is highly soluble in plasma, which in itself is made mostly of water. The lipid content is also a player. Icodextrin and, of course, sample viscosity and 
hypotension, low blood pressure can also cause aberrant results. Questions regarding this? Yes. So is this still a, I mean, has it started to establish a valid technique or is it still being developed? Uh, for the, the actual uh, photometric glucose testing? Yeah, it's essentially a valid technique, but now it's uh, being replaced more by amperometric methods, just uh, <coughs> from, uh, from that standpoint. The, the range of sensitivity, was it, was it suitable or, or physiologic? Um, I'm not aware of any uh, differences, but out of just from the perspective of ease of manufacturing, for example, the amperometric biosensors are much easier to uh, construct just based on the fact that we just etch, etch it onto a metallic plate versus the, um, the actual color changing scheme of the photometric sensors. But our previous study, though, we did see more uh, more changes when exposed to high hematocrit and low hematocrit when comparing it to various other devices that are uh, amperometric based. It's, uh, I think it's in our paper that was published in uh, Diabetes Ther Technology and Therapeutics, so I could probably provide anyone that if you want to look at comparisons between these devices. And in that paper, we actually use a new method of analysis to, to discern the differences in performance of these assays. So uh, at least <coughs> in terms of the hematocrit story, I just want to mention that um, there are um, efforts to improve this. There's an instrument out there that measures the magnet before testing glucose and automatically corrects for that result. So they are making efforts to make it more accurate. Let's change gears once again. We now have non-invasive oxygen saturation monitoring. So can anyone tell me, it's already said, it says it right here, but what's the importance of this uh, cell right here, the red blood cell? Does anyone know? <laughs> yeah, the oxygen molecule. But what's so important about it? Because if you were to have a molecule that just carries oxygen, that's I can make it. Uh, I can make that chemically. You know, we can figure out what's going on. Just have a molecule that carries oxygen all day. But what's so important about hemoglobin and the red blood cell? Exactly. So that, that's one of the very um, miraculous things about this. Um, tetrameric protein, it knows when to release oxygen in the presence of low partial oxygen and pressure. And of course, when there's high partial oxygen pressure, as shown here in arterial blood, it retains oxygen more, as shown in this graph. So the x-axis here is the hemoglobin saturation, where this is full saturation, and uh, this is essentially low saturation on the hemoglobin molecules, and this is PO2 measured in millimeters of mercury. So, Ages ago, the way to measure that is, of course, you do a blood gas, draw some blood from an arterial line or an artery, and that's obviously not fun for the patient. And potentially it could cause infections as well because you're sticking someone. So eventually, as technology developed, especially in terms of microprocessor technology, they came up with transcutaneous oxygen saturation monitoring. The underlying principle is essentially the use of non-invasive optical differentiation between a oxyhemoglobin versus deoxyhemoglobin. This is based on using red versus infrared light uh, to discern the difference between those two oxygenated states of hemoglobin. This allows you to identify oxygen saturation, pulse monitoring, as well as other analytes with more recent um, devices which use more than two wavelengths, right? So light, um, in about 12, I believe, for this new instrument, which I will show shortly. So the principles of pulse oximetry, so this is the actual technology that they use in the hospital for transcutaneous oxygen saturation monitoring. You have an LED light, which emits light at 650 and 805 nanometers, so red and infrared light. So in the case of oxyhemoglobin, since it's very bright red, you can say that, of course, it reflects more red light. So more, if your blood here had high levels of oxyhemoglobin, it's highly oxygenated, more red light will reflect out. It will pass through and be detected by the photodetector. Conversely, deoxyhemoglobin has a tendency to reflect more IR light, and you could also say that it absorbs more red light. Of course, as it passes through a sample, if there's low or, or any level of deoxyhemoglobin, these changes can be detected by the photodetector. As it goes through, both 
light sources will pass through, and the red and infrared ratio are then measured by the instrument. This is just a little equation to measure oxygen saturation. And of course, I can provide you with the paper to see how that works in real life, but it compares the values of stored reference methods. And then it extrapolates that into this value here. So this is as best as I can do to reproduce the display that you see on a pulse ox machine in the hospital. So this is your uh, oxygen saturation in percent. So 100% is ideal. Now the question is, where does pulse oximetry get its name? You already figured out the oximetry part. But what about the pulse? So the pulse component is able to discern the increases and decreases in absorbance over time because your heart pumps um, not continuously, relatively, it's not a continuous flow, but pulsatile flow. So it's able to discern those differences and then translate into heart rate. So you have here A9 beats per minute. Another thing that you might want to consider is what about venous blood? Because of course, arteries aren't the only blood vessels going through your finger, for example. There's also the venous end, which comes back towards the heart. So in the actual device is able to discern between, like I said, pulsatile flow versus non-pulsatile flow. It's then able to look at that graphically and then eliminate that venous interference, that background noise that's there. And I could probably give you more detailed information about that following this lecture if you need to. And I also brought in a pulse ox device for you to see in detail how that works. So the clinical significance of pulse oximetry, the traditional Technology uses two wavelengths. Again, red and infrared light. You can look for states of hypoxia, so blood um, low oxygenation. So if you're hypoxemic, you have low um, blood oxygenation. Levels that are greater than 95% are considered normal. Lesser values may indicate hypoxia, so that's not good. This could be due to poor ventilation. People with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, smokers, as well as other pathological states, including mechanical ventilation, may exhibit low SpO2 levels. You also look at heart rate, so you can see elevated or depressed heart rate, tachycardia or bradycardia, respectively. With the new 12 length pulse, a 12 wavelength pulse oximetry, this was approved actually recently by the FDA. You can also look for hemoglobin levels. So it'll measure this quantitative. Levels less than 7 grams per deciliter could indicate anemia. So low hemoglobin levels, this could be due to bleeding or any other variety of uh, pathologies. And this could indicate the time to transfuse blood in the critical care unit. Inhalation injury. So patients who are in a fire may breathe in carbon monoxide or other noxious agents and cause damage to their respiratory lining. They breathe in carbon monoxide, which has an extremely high affinity to hemoglobin, more so than oxygen. And you'll see a presence of carboxy hemoglobin. So you could um, use this to indicate to the burn surgeon that this patient has inhalation injury, and that is a marker of poor outcomes in that patient group. Clinical exposure, or chemical exposure, sorry. Exposure to chemicals such as nitrates and chlorobenzenes can change hemoglobin by adding a, a methyl group on it. So methemoglobin levels may indicate exposure to environmental chemicals. So this slide shows three types of pulse oximeters. First on the left is the device for Massimo. This is the one with the 12 wavelengths for uh, testing a variety of, of markers, including hemoglobin as well as the oxygen saturation and pulse. It also does carboxy hemoglobin as well as methemoglobin. The nail core device, a little bit smaller, but I show it here because it also has a biosensor to put on your forehead, so that's a little bit useful for patients who don't have easy access to their fingers. You'd be surprised at how little access there is in many of these critically ill patients. The nail device, which I brought in today, is very small. It fits on your finger and only looks for oxygen saturation and heart rate. So any questions so far in this section? Because we played around with the donut quite a bit. And that one seems to operate only when it's exit pulse. Yes. So if somebody's in shock and there's no discernible pulse, can you use these devices? Uh, actually, as it uh, drops below, uh, at least from a saturation standpoint, if it drops below 85%, it gets progressively more inaccurate, as well as low pulse top flow as well. So in patients that uh, either are in shock, for example, or even on basal pressures, these drugs that will 
increase your um, your blood pressure, that can cause aberrant results as well. There's no reason why the O2 test measurement can't be done. You can't discern between the difference because uh, when we go back to that point where um, it tries to identify venous blood versus arterial blood, it, it's really dependent on that pulsatile flow. So as it, those two markers get closer together, the venous blood and arterial blood, it has a harder time discerning between um, those two types of blood flow. What is the general O2 stat of venous blood? The O2 stat of venous blood is about uh, between at uh, 100 to 120 millimeters mercury, especially in the um, um, patient. That's the partial pressure, at least. And for the O2 stat in percent, that's between uh, 95 to 100 percent. Well, no, wait. For venous blood? Oh, did you say arterial? For venous blood. In venous blood, what would be the oxygen temperature? Oh, it's far less than that. It's about... Uh, 45, 44 to 45 millimeters per mercury, yeah. So, confounding factors in pulse oximetry. So what can go wrong, as um, Dr. Schwang already um, mentioned, a lot of things can um, play a role in interfering with your results. So ambient light, motion, surgical diathermy, carboxyhemoglobin, as I mentioned, and methylene blue. So in a room where there's lots of light and, the, and your biosensor is not covered up appropriately, that can interfere with your results. Motion, this is a very um, amusing form of uh, photo interference. You'll, you'll stand there in an ICU and all of a sudden you see the patient's um, oxygen saturation go down. The alarms go off and you go in there concerned that they aren't breathing too well, only to find out that they're trying to get out of bed and flailing their arms around. So that's something to know. Surgical diathermy is um, the use of electrical um, current to uh, simulate blood flow that can cause, um, this is in surgical patients, this can cause photo interference. Carboxyhemoglobin, I didn't mention this earlier, but when carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, it still retains its red color. So if it's not carrying oxygen, but it's still red, the pulse, ox pulse oximeter will not know the difference. But however, with 12 wavelengths in that new instrument, it's able to discern that difference. That's where the, the technology jump occurred. Methylene blue is a dye, and uh, based on this methyl group right here, also methylates hemoglobin, causing an elevated methemoglobin count. So due to detector failure rates, because of a variety of photo interfering effects, it actually occurs between about 5 to 50% of the time in these patients. It reduces sensitivity and specificity from 92 to 74 percent and 90 to 84 percent, respectively. So these things are quite important, especially the critical ill patient group. Something to be mindful of when you're um, using these devices. So from another standpoint, you have hypoperfusion, so blood, blood, low blood flow to certain areas, specifically to where your biosensor is. This can be due to cardiovascular disease. Hypoxia, the patient's not breathing well. Sepsis, in sepsis there is a uh, tendency for increased vascular permeability leading to edema, so swelling of the fingers and extremities. So if your finger swells up, the bowel sensor might not be able to read well. Respiratory diseases and so forth. So as the Hummler paper states, hypoperfusion from various etiologies result in reduction of red blood cells and pulsatile flow. Low perfusion indices lead to increased bias. So, as uh, Dr. Schwann stated that, the noting device that I brought in, it's really dependent on the pulse. This is actually the pulse of top flow measured by the instrument right here, and it's measured in perfusion indexes, or indices. The higher the PI, the better and more reliable the results. As these get lower, your results become much, much less. This is correlated, uh, the PI is correlated with these, um, these waveforms. If there's hypoxia, what does that do to the perfusion index? The perfusion index in hypoxia, the PI will still be high, uh, assuming that everything else is normal. Then your O2 stats will just drop down. And that's, I mean, but that's not an interference. That's what you're, that's how you know. Potentially, yes, if they're hypoxic. But sometimes some of these patients, you may not know if they're truly hypoxic or not. So what you're looking for, at least in terms of, um, um, let's see, from that, that for mechanically ventilated patients, for example, they may have what they call acute respiratory 
a distress syndrome. So fluids accumulate in their lungs. They may be breathing perfectly fine, but you may not know if they are truly hypoxemic or not because as the um, let's see, as the device actually measures appropriately, you're relying on the PI. The PI looks great. O2 stats about 95%, but they may still be hypoxic, uh, hypoxic as shown here. I'm not sure if I was clear or not for that. As, as you get lower, as you get lower because of hypoxemia, whether it be 95% or 85%, it gets more inaccurate. That's, that's the whole point. It actually, as you bring it lower, the more inaccurate the device gets, as uh, several studies have shown that. So if it was at 85%, it could actually be 70%, just based on the potential error shown in that device. Okay. So does it boil down to actually knowing the spectral spectra coming out at the two wavelengths? Like is one getting below measurable limits? Potentially, yes. When you're talking about yes. like below 95, mm -hmm. like 90% exactly. Yeah. Well, you can really tell if something might be wrong. Something might be wrong, and then you order what's called a blood gas test. So they you just take an arterial blood sample, and then you know the exact PO2 of blood in the arterial or even in venous, depending on what you order. So that's when you confirm it. And they actually rely on that more. So the nurses actually, when they're standing there, they'll, they'll see it go down. They might make adjustments, increase the O2. They're not concerned about it until, until a blood gas comes back, which they'll probably order to confirm that result. So now we can uh, conclude. Diagnostic devices are progressively moving towards the point of care. This is to address the healthcare needs in the United States as well as other places. This includes uh, pathogen detection and real-time monitoring. So you can see that uh, pulse, oximetry, uh, pulse oximetry is a real good example of real-time monitoring. If you can come into a unit and just hook yourself up to a non-invasive electrode and let it run all day, however long in the hospital, that's great without poking someone with a needle all the time. So optical point care testing may provide evidence-based, minimally invasive, or non-invasive methods to detect diseases earlier, thereby improving outcomes. Confounding factors represent a challenge to all types of biosensors, including optical technologies. And lastly, the future lies with reagent-free and non-destructive optical point care testing, which may facilitate cost-effective diagnostic alternatives to the United States and low resource countries. So again, I like to use the pulse oximetry example as a um, good, good uh, way to show that you know, non-destructive technology as well as reagent reagentless technology in the optical field is really important to strive for. And now let's go to future directions. You can see that the trends in point of care technology, specifically in optical detection, has made great strides so far to go towards that goal that I, uh, or that conclusion that I stated, where we have reagentless optical bile detection. So it all started back a long time ago in 1674 with Anton von Leeuwenhoek with his uh, light microscope, and then we jump a couple hundred years to the future. In 1968, we have our first flow cytometer. I'm not sure if any of you used the flow cytometer before. Of course, back then, it was a gigantic machine, like many other things back then. In 1971, we have the Ames um, reflectance um, meter. This is the first glucose meter. And uh, it's based uh, off of Bruce Ames. What's that? that based off I'm not sure. I'm not aware, but I, for some reason that does ring a bell, so it's possible. Then we get the Ames test for carcinogen. Oh, uh, it's not that. Not for that. I don't think it's that necessarily with the salmonella and so forth. Yeah. Really, yeah. So this device actually started off for photometric glucose testing. 1979. First pulse oximeter. This is then uh, reported by uh, Severing House in 1987, but this is one of the first devices. You can see how big it is compared to that little finger uh, based noting device. The biosensor here is, you can look at it later. The biosensor is about this big and fits on the patient's <coughs> ear. In 1991, the first infrared non invasive glucose biosensor, the first patent was filed for it. There's still, that's still in development. I have not seen anything new regarding such devices. In 1996, we have application of green fluorescent proteins, so many of us in the basic sciences may have run into GFP before, of course, the GFP rabbit. And now here, this is a very uh, interesting development, 2005-2006, uh, 
they use the well-known Raman spectroscopy and coherent anti-stokes Raman scattering. I'm not sure if that's been covered in this um, class or not. Okay, so you probably know about this already. It's used for labelless cancer cell detection. There's hopes that it could be used for pathogen detection as well. So, and of course, it's by Dr. Chan up in the Center for Biophotonic Science and Technology. This slide right here shows some emerging technologies. You might have seen this. I think it's from UCLA. Essentially a microscope optics attached to your cell phone. Now you have a cell phone microscope. Take a blood sample. Now you take a picture of it using your cell phone and see how many white blood cells, red blood cells are on there. So it's pretty interesting. Potential cost-effective cost way of doing a microscopy in other countries. Here is an infrared glucose monitoring device. This is merely a, a um, just a model. So haven't seen any recent studies on this yet that shows performance, but still an interesting development because it can facilitate non-invasive monitoring of blood glucose. Here we have a small device from Micronics. This is a flow cytometer compared to a laptop. So you can see how much has changed since the 60s, and it's a card-based device. The card is already developed by the company. Each of these colored areas are reagents for the device. It is then fed via microfluidics, and it's able to do a complete blood count, which, which calculates how many platelets, how much hemoglobin, how many red blood cells in hematocrit, and white blood cells that are in the sample. So it's rather interesting in that um, development. Especially this last slide gives you an overview of what we do at our center, our um, NIH-funded center. So these are the point of care testing global opportunities. And of course, you're more than welcome to stop by our, our lab uh, down on Davis campus as well as up in Sacramento. Part of our program is to fund other institutes in developing devices for rapid pathogen detection for critical and emergency and disaster care. Uh, we recently funded two devices, one from here at UC Davis, Dr. Alexander Resman. I'm not sure if you uh, run into it. He teaches the biomaterials course here at UC Davis. And he developed a protein microarray multiplex pathogen detection system where you first purify a sample of pathogens. So you bring out the pathogens. So that's what you want to look for. This is based on dielectrical phoresis. And then these pathogens are then bound to specific antibodies on this um, cassette, this cartridge right here. These pathogens are then lysed, releasing their DNA. So this does not rely on nucleic acid amplification, nothing to do with PCR. Specific proteins are then applied to bind to sequences on that DNA. These are zinc finger proteins. Very interesting because these are from our hormone receptors, essentially. Same concept applies there. And these are dimeric proteins we can dimerize onto a specific sequence. You can then essentially couple this to an enzymatic reaction or a fluorescent-based reaction to tell you if there's a presence of a specific sequence of DNA. Another device which is not optical-based but still worth mentioning is by Dr. Richard Larson out of the University of New Mexico and San Zia National Laboratories. It uses a surface acoustic wave biosensor where you have transducers on either side of a matrix of antibodies. When bound to a virus, for example, the density of this antibody complex is increased, so the surface acoustic wave generated by this, these transducers is altered. There's a phase differential, which then is detected by the instrument. This is for use in um, emergency blood donor um, screening. So in, in emergencies, you want to take the blood from those who want to donate it and make sure they don't have HIV or hepatitis B or C. Our device that we're working with, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, is a pathogen detection device. As I mentioned previously, I remember you guys are familiar with uh, polymerase chain reaction, so it requires increases and decreases in temperature. This amplifies the DNA, but does it at a single temperature, 63 degrees Celsius. This allows it for use in disaster care. So it's great because if I were to bring a PCR device out there where the temperature has to be cycled all the time, it's more difficult to keep it controlled, especially if you're in New Orleans after Katrina where the temperature is 100 degrees with 100% humidity. So this looks for five pathogens, and um, we're continuing work on it as we speak. All these devices will then be compared to uh, current and existing commercial systems, if possible, as a reference for um, 
performance evaluation. So there's our septic fast device, as well as the septic device, the one that's currently FDA approved for um, resistant bacterial screen. So that's essentially it. And I left some time open, about 10 minutes, so that you can check out any of these devices or ask me questions. So and that's our acknowledgments. But questions? Have you, have you heard of anybody using um, single cell Raman spec to measure insulin uh, sensitivity using like butyrate glucose, isotope labor? No, I have not. But Frank, have you heard anything about that? Anybody uh, trying to assess insulin sensitivity using isotope labeling and glucose? Yeah, no, I don't think it's a good idea. Have you heard of anybody doing that? Or? I mean, I, we may have, may have heard of somebody using that. Could you? <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I mean, you might have just said that. I said that talking to him about it. He's interested in doing that. I just, kind of reminded me because you were showing the different things for insulin or uh, Google's insulin assessment. I know there was some issues with, um, I don't want to say invasiveness, but like the time, because I mean, you can have to, what is it, Spencer's, they have to do like drink a bunch of food yep. and they have to sit there or they'll do the double cannulated mm -hmm. thing and so they're trying to... So yeah, the glucose like, tolerance test, that's not really fun for anyone. Yeah. So, but essentially, yeah, there's a lot of work. Of course, the receptor stuff uh, over at Pharmacology Toxicology, they, they do that all the time. These ligand labeled uh, receptor uh, assays for just kinetic monitoring, but not to the extent of, um, from clinical perspective, I'm not too, not too uh, up to that yet. Other questions? I know that there are a lot of different components to, you know, diagnostic technologies, everything from discovering, you know, biomarkers for either disease or health to um, sample preparation and handling to actually developing techniques for detection. Mm -hmm. you know, what you want to Would you say that there's a, where is the biggest hurdle or, or where, where, you know, we have good enough technology we really need to focus in this area rather than that area? From my point of view, there, there's at least two uh, two parts to this. At least the reagent list and non-destructive component that's that's very challenging. And um, but another very important one that spans across all technologies, not just uh, um, photon-based technologies, the pre-analytical processing step. You have to make it simple enough for almost any user to use. So there's something called a CLIA waiver, where the device has to be simple enough so that a you don't need a fully trained personnel, fully trained personnel to use it. The other aspect is um, to make it simple enough to have the proper amount of sample to be drawn. Uh, you want to keep that in check, and also contamination. So from the pathogen detection standpoint, you want to keep things um, closed during the pre analytical processing step when you're looking for DNA, for example. You or I will have all these organisms living on our skin right now, and one of the key organisms is Staphylococcus species coagulase negative staph. That is an organism that can be confused with Staphylococcus aureus if your primer design isn't um, specific enough. And even when it's specific enough, you may have other issues with that, which I can go in more detail, but you don't want contamination. You want to keep it easy. You also want to keep it cost effective because some of these devices, as we continue on uh, in the world, may be used out in low resource countries. They may not have facilities to have a lab and so forth. So. So yeah, those are the two areas I think are really important. pre analytical processing and how to overcome the hurdle least in photon-based technologies and how to keep it reagent-free or reagent-less. Uh, reagent are these point of, point of care PCR machines, are they, are they quicker than, I mean, I do PCR all the time, it takes hours, you know, like are they quicker than... Some? Right now, um, the... So one of the key points is the only point of care uh, PCR device that's out there for pathogen detection was that bile threat device. So it, bio yeah, threat. for bile threat, so anthrax, uh, smallpox viruses. So those are kept locked up some warehouse somewhere until something goes wrong in the yeah. country. So we, the doctors out there, they haven't seen any of these devices. And so, but from that perspective, the current PCR-based pathogen detection systems today take between one and five hours. Yeah. So it's for Septifast, what I used for my dissertation, took two and a half hours of manual processing. And as um, one of the reasons why I mentioned pre-analytical processing is a big challenge was my device is really susceptible to those organisms I mentioned. It could have come from my skin. It could have come from, yeah. from that. But yeah, two and a half hours, and the 
the previous device, shown here on the bottom right here, actually takes one hour, and the pre-analytical processing step is actually two minutes. It's a cartridge-based device. There's still a hands-on time. That two minutes could be a lifetime. You could have dropped that with one little skin flake into it, and that could have just messed up your result. But it's improving. And I think, in, at least in uh, our opinion as a center, uh, cassette-based tests that has no manual processing step on it is ideal. You just put a sample in, and put it in the machine, let it run, hands-free. Are there any other questions? So, the cassette based, I understand, array is it kind of like a microarray? Uh, does it have a whole like a profile of all the different pathogens that you're For For with? cassette based, uh, it can vary, of course, but it contains anything that you can throw away. And so, for um, from Affymetrics, if you're called the, the, the gene chip, that is an example, a very expensive example. Yeah. But from this perspective, this cassette essentially carries the microfluidics in chambers as well as the component for sonication. So that's the component to rip apart the cells uh, inside that cassette, which is a great thing. I don't have to shake in a centrifuge and so forth. So it's all built inside here. It also contains the, um, the primers and probes already in there. I don't have to add anything more into it. And then you just plug it into the device, and then it looks through fluorescence. It has a port in the back that will then show fluorescence with real-time PCR. So everything's contained there as, as cost-effective as can be. I think that's... Well, I'd like to thank Dan for a superbly clear, yeah, well-illustrated lecture. And you will have it, if not already, on YouTube. You want to go back and get the slide and have yeah. it available for you. Dan, I had just a couple of comments, questions. I've waited until this been so through their list. Is every house credited with the invention of pulse oximeter? Is that what you said? No. Uh, 1987 was that paper, but I think the 71 was from Japan. It, the pulse oximeter. What was the date on the uh, timeline you showed? Was it 71 or was it 87? It was uh, 71, but the paper that uh, I referenced based on the, um, the history of pulse oximeter is by Severing House in uh, 87. Oh. So uh, right here, it's in 79 was when um, oh, the I Japanese got it, and this is just a little reference to Severing House. Yeah. Yeah. You did work with Dr. Severing House. Yeah, this is yeah. my prop at UCSF. Uh, yeah. My PhD thesis, so it caught my eye now. <laughs> this guy is the inventor of the ECO to the carbon dioxide electrode with stove. So it's called the stove Severing House CO2 electrode. And the second thing for the question about is there a point of care PCR device? In fact, there is one, not necessarily for human application, but for the guidance. Our copii at LLL made mm -hmm. this very cool little box about so big it looks like your mm -hmm. what player now? I don't know, a CD player. Or a you know, little bit bigger than an iPod, uh, probably about four iPods. Uh, yeah, four <laughs> iPods. So, four or five plus seconds. So it's going down to a mile under the ocean. And Mari on a rate to do on site analysis. Quite a nice little device that will end up with the Smithsonian, sure. So, in regard to Frank's questions about where's it all at now, well, the point of care field is mature. It's basically a done deal. So, now it's kind of like a little horse race, but we have some specific analyte detection methods that are in fact, in fact packed, like the Tour of California. There are still minutes off, but we pathogen detection is clearly one of those. So folks would tend to say, gee, if we can do it in an hour, that's accurate. Other tests do not want to really wait an hour. The glucose store you heard, nurses can't really afford to wait more than about 15 minutes because they're going to cycle insulin. And they want to complete a treatment cycle in an hour. So they need, obviously, at the front end of that slot, like 5 or 15, or actually just 2 minutes to the glucose store. So if you think about where is this all going, well, the future is to get at what NAM was presenting to you, which is to have pre-analytic solution, which would be the light technology, I think, fundamentally, and a radiation free method. For because it's simply too expensive for the world to diagnose it. It's impossible to have all kinds of problems going. 
non-diabetes, we have existing problems with HIV, these are all considered oral epidemics. And one of the big ones is the pandemic, the avian influenza comes out in Indonesia or China and marches down the West Coast. And everybody will be very serious about that. So, Frank, I think that because I'm busy and that's busy and so on, um, James Chan already tried you know, to put his effort into for funding with the uh, UPAO President's office and then make it there for Frank E. He didn't know anybody. But if you or Dennis or somebody can provide the administrative and structural support for the whole thing, I think there should be a grant application going for the new stimulus plan, which NIH is presently announced. Day. I got an alert from the guy who said, wait for the director to speak. And you guys should know about it. Didn't they say it was 10-3? Huh? Didn't they say it was 10-3? Ten, ten well, there was a thing today that came out early in the morning on the listservs that said, the leader will speak later today. And yeah, there would be a, the mouth is as important as how they're going to deal with it. Or what the director of NIH, the directorship of NIH is in transition. Now, obviously, there will be plenty of people in line is there a separate line item for disaster medicine? Separate from I don't know. And I don't know. Right now, behind the scenes, all the different institutes are jockeying for this money. Yeah. Of course, our director, Dr. Portley, for this program, we have four centers in the state. It's got her ticket already. She's going to try to get more money for what we call the supplemental grant, the second uh, collaborative funding that we have in the United States program. But uh, every day I say, oh my God, what James Chan is doing, the life that comes, and so forth. How can we get this thing mustered up so we can do a grant application like this? Because I just came from, I have, uh, I'm faculty at Bangkok too. I have a full time research assistant there. I just went through a number of surveys. It's just so obvious, so apparent that the, the world's health problems are the primary care of the world. The one that we saw when we free technology is not our point here. So that's where the problem is going on. And Nam made that point many times. What do you think, Frank? Can you, is there some way to get a Yeah, well, team so it happens, it happens on my letter of intent that's supposed to go in by Friday, which uh -huh. is supposed to be directed at the uh, California-Canadian uh, strategic alliances. And so I'm trying to propose a joint center for investment in the use of funds. Oh. Well, then that's what and you can so, so this could be kind of the design of something that we could submit also for the that So it's right. like they secured some use of UC together with the, the consortium of Canadian universities, uh -huh. basically put in this platform. And so it's, it's not to fund the center itself, but right now it's just the early stage in developing a detailed business plan and setting up uh, workshops and kind of discussion. So it's kind of it doesn't be that, but what really needs to happen is to go for the uh, irrespective of some of the yeah, administrative yeah. funding. Right, right. So, so I'm in charge of kind of a vision for what the center is about. You know, we've got business people coming up with what they're proposing for the development of the So, so. It's only because you know, no one's given me any kind of really clear sense for what we should propose, uh, what mechanism to, to submit through. Well, I think Nam did today, clearly. You know, we know where it should go on kind of this thing age. Right, but, but through, so should we submit it as a, like a dual one or as a. But that we have to do that. Or is it the director says that we can get with it? Right. The only right. way to do this right is to submit it directly to NIH and get with the different program directors and have them help us. And our uh, NIH site list is you know, six, so that you can ask the people at that time to request the ground of the right out of the CPSP how we should go with their chunk of the results. So we're approaching our NSF at DC when we can do it like this. Whether or not we can apply for a supplement to the uh, whether it's better for the we've already been given a list of what I'm doing to the Thank you.
uh, for for centers and institutions that we could implement if we secure Okay. Well, I'm thinking out loud too. Yeah, no. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys want the PowerPoint slide, or you can yeah, contact so him by email too. Okay. So, uh, I'll, if it's okay with yeah. You, Sounds good. And of course, uh, in the next 48 hours, or so we'll pop it up on YouTube too. If you guys want to go through that. So, yeah. Can they download the slides from that YouTube site? Uh, no. No. It's, I tried it with other stuff, but yeah, it's locked on, yeah. Okay, thank you. Great job, now. Guys, try to take a quick look at it full size. That's a hard to do. We're going to have a green Venus. Here you go, then. This is where you So, essentially, for... Uh, so, Dr. Fox, yeah, all we're doing right now is just right. trying to figure so out how we can... So, for Pulse, uh, I'll... Uh, 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 we're doing good. All right, that's good. So, essentially, you have a background noise uh, with... Uh, uh, so, um, Venus Blitz is in the top. Okay, it's, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Choices yeah. Maybe with that. There isn't a heart pump. You have that buff. So, you have that background over right here. And you have each buff. So, it figures out the baseline for the Venus Blitz. Oh, okay. So, you just subtract. So, the map map, the subtraction, and the map. That's good. 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 You know, I think Jane has to mention that it starts to get too low. <laughs> yeah, more yeah. Okay. So, of course, this one, you don't have heart rate. <laughs> okay, you don't have... But yeah, of course, these are the other... Yeah, so... Yeah. So, what is actually the state of the art at the moment in... Uh, uh, the the See, yeah, there's something like non innovative. Uh, that's right. Really yeah, like there's different things. Different things. Only, yeah, there's mainly most of them are um, needle based mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But they, there was yeah. work on yeah. non basis yeah. pilot yeah. yeah. for transcutaneous yeah. draw the blood through yeah. the first yeah. pilot of freezes, such as charge. The problem is, is these two little minor burn marks and everything, and it changes the biosensor every four days, which costs about. Oh, so that kind of went out of business. Yeah. Uh, the state of the art in terms of glucose mining, though, is this device called Bottom line Strip. Strip. It's the one that I mentioned that it adjusts for hematocrit, yeah. that red blood cell counts that will be automatically. Yeah. So that's it's more accurate. Uh, you can probably, if, you, if anyone's interested, just email me. I'll send you one of our papers that we did. We evaluated how accurate that is versus really really everything else. Really sure. yeah. But what about the Oh, okay. Um, no, I really don't have that question. I think that was well, that's like what we take is uh, we should basically implant like a small, uh, like small cell, yeah, by a sensor underneath and then just read out. There's a uh, one called the freestyle. That's the one coupled to the uh, I think another device that has the infusion pump connected to it. So it's connected to label free. Uh, this one from here, okay. And all it is is a small file that is off this table. Really tiny needle. You just push it on there, save the room, so damage over And then. Um, just draw samples over time. Well, the problem with that is we have two reasons. One is the balance should get fouled up just because we'll get fouled up in a lot of these things. Try to get fouled up and the enzymes get used up. So, I mean, I know enzymes are was a catalyst, but they will exhibit enzyme fatigue essentially. The other thing is it might not be accurate as taking directly from blood samples because over time there's an inflammatory response there. So it alters the glucose uptake in that little area that you're looking. Is it clinically significant? Probably not, at least in everyday use for you or me. Is it statistically significant? Probably that's one of the things that pop it up. So that's something that just draw back to all of them. That's for continuous monitors, that's a new area. I mean, that's the money. Because it would be that's what we're, right, we're doing. What we're doing is there going to be possibility? Is there going to develop like a net on non I think pretty difficult. They're trying with the infrared. They're trying with infrared, infrared for a long time. A year ago, I went to yeah. the conference. They had a little device with your thumb in there, but I haven't heard about it since. So it's still very skeptical with the IR based technology. And 
can be measured just glucose in general is easy. It just because of the blood matrix, it's like it's in red blood cells, protein, and then just the variability between you and me and everyone else. And not to mention sick people in the hospital. It's hard. And I, the state of the art truly, what it's trying for is not invasive, continuous monitoring that accounts for infection. Okay, really, that's, that's, that's a take-home yeah. message for everybody else yeah. yeah. out there, photonics or not. Yeah. 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 You yeah. Yeah. Time. Yeah. It carries the yeah. yeah. so yeah. 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 I can see the given yeah. antibodies, yeah. you can see the infection yeah. levels drop yeah. or increase. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm using the wrong antibodies. Yeah. 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 You can do that. You can do that real time. That's great. And not a basic. Personalized medicine, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I see it going. Not in the next 10 years. I had to 50 something years ago. Yes. But that's where we are. Yeah. Not long ago. 50 years ago. Well, it's 50 years ago. How did you do that? Exactly. Yeah. So this device right here <laughs> popped up around 2003, right? I could pick us 25 different organisms at the right. same time this from blood. Enough money so if you have 25 organisms in blood, program. it'll show on my list. Now, just since that was kind of in development since 2003, so there's no way to compare it to the most problem when you yeah. come up with something completely new. There's nothing to compare it to. The FDA is going to yeah. you know, you're going to have to come up with study well, 10,000 patients with you know, not time. Time. and to compare it with new yeah. ways you might have to come with new mathematical ways to compare things. And that's been a very difficult challenge for that to find the most many groups. So it's your knowledge. Definitely not part. Yeah, talk to your doctor. Yeah. We are at all the other essentially yeah. specialties. Yeah. 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 All right. That goes off. Oh, all right. Thank, Thank you. you. So, what? Yeah. 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 So patients with fibromyalgia and people at risk of developing neck type and neck type. Right now, I think so you know, obviously stool yeah. is, is is one way. You know, basically I'll take stool samples from yeah. the patients. Yeah, it's very primers for clostridia. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. So you like that C diff one? Yeah. 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 So I, I I sort you know I'll, I'll survey for that, but it's not very quick. So some labs that are using they're trying through right. advanced clinical yeah. methods to basically correlate certain metabolites in the blood yeah. based off what they use in the GI tract, which is really yeah. hard. Hard to do, but yeah, I mean, they're, you know, um, so I mean, you know, if, if you guys have to offer, you know, gastroenterologists could have, you know, one of these point care technologists where they could take a patient oh, yeah. and they could base a, a, a either a probiotic, prebiotic, or dietary disease based off their gut composition. Yeah, you use well. Yeah, the gut. I, I know people yeah, kind of crowd like, what's going on with the gut. The gut's an important place. Like, a lot of the burn yeah. patients I work with, so a the lot of patients. Yeah, the burn wound patients. A lot of the gram negative bacteria that infect them three weeks later is probably from gut translocation. Yeah. And I'm getting to see this. This device also tests for C. diff too in an hour, so that might be of interest for you. But there's, yeah, so other markers, and you know, just endotoxin screening for a variety of other. That's what they use now. It's not too, um, not too, um, all the yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you really want to uh, focus more on uh, like C. diff, for example, one of our experts is uh, Dr. Stuart Cohen of the Med Center, so C O H E N, and he's the uh, chief of infectious diseases and infection control. Richard Cohen? Oh, no, Stuart. Stuart. And he's, been, uh, he's one of our national experts in uh, C. diff infections in uh, ICU patients. So. Yeah, lots of lots of interesting stuff out there. I mean, some of these things could even be just applied to which general like optimal health for people, not even if they're sick. Like if you're just trying to with the relationship now with different bacteria in your body, you know, and that participation that they play, yep. what we eat, and the drugs that we metabolize, and everything, if we can get a get a better, quicker idea of what that person. Is colonized but yep. for you yeah. to make those clinical decisions. I mean, what is it right now? Sequencing takes you know months. Months, so yeah. You know, it's true. Yeah, it's anyway, anyway, well, like you said, you know, it's made towards personalized medicine from yeah. that perspective. So, crazy, man. Up that should be interesting. So, you're, which graduate group are you with? Nutritional. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in my own portion of the Oh, okay, awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah, have you been up to that center for about the time? Yeah, I just took a tour last week. Oh, cool. Yeah, yes. Yeah, John, John Rutledge's lab, you know him? Oh, yeah, um, Dr. Rutledge, yeah. endocrinology. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, 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 we work with him sometimes uh, in the endocrinology uh, clinic. Uh, we do some glucose yeah. studies over there, too, to assess the performance of those glucose devices. But, um, yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm down the first floor. First of GBSF? I uh, know at the um, uh, CBSC. We also have a lab at Tucker, too, if, if, if you're interested. Show up there. Uh, yeah, we have a care lab. Mm-hmm. Well, point of care lab. Yeah, we do stress testing, too. We actually try to test these devices out now to see if they work in the, um, the field. So crank up the temperature, or decrease the temperature, or humidity. So we do all that stuff, too. It's part of our NIH funding, so it's, it's pretty fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your attention.